Hey everyone, you are listening to the Omnitalk Fast Five, brought to you in partnership with Microsoft, the AM Consumer and Retail Group, Takeoff and Suzzle. The Omnitalk Fast Five podcast is a podcast that we hope makes you feel a little smarter, but most importantly, a little happier each week, too. Today is May 19th. I'm your host, Ann Mazinga. And I'm Chris Walton. And we are here once again to discuss all the top headlines making waves in the world of omni channel retailing. Um, Chris, I was making waves last week at my girls trip. I went surfing. <laughs> I know you were. I know you were. Any big stories you want to tell us about from that weekend? Oh, man. Making waves. How, how, did you get up? Did you get up on the board? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I did. Multiple I mean, times. It took me a long time, nice. but I'm very bruised and battered, but I got up again and it's just the, San Clemente is like, I've decided that's just my, place. is that your happy place? Oh my God. It's your Hawaii for it. you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Your Hawaii. Yes. It's, you're a Hawaii it's my person. Hawaii for it's your Hawaii. Whatever. You know what I meant. I know what you're you gonna, mean. I know what you, mean. I noticed your opening there too. It was a big, it was a big, like, hello, everyone. That was kind yeah. of a new opening, new twist. You, you feeling know, good today? I think you just got to change it up. everyone. Yeah. I'm wearing my bear coast coffee t-shirt. This is the coffee shop in San Clemente that I'm like, I went to every day. It was Jeez, you're like, is this? Is, I feel like this podcast is sponsored by the San Clemente Chamber of Commerce, and already. If if they could become a sponsor, I would. <laughs> you would, yeah, you would if gladly. They, if they can, if they can also prostitute yourself if to they the can San also Clemente subsidize Chamber of Commerce. some of the real estate there, that yeah, would be right. even better. <laughs> right. Um, but we've got an awesome show. Like, I can't wait to get this. I think this this there's a hell of a lot of meat on the bones of the headlines this week because we're going to talk about Walmart and Target's earnings. And of course, we also have this is our monthly podcast, which is my favorite episode we do every month, where yes. our AM friends are going to join us. But before we introduce them, and I got an exciting review to read this week. We, we do. Yeah. I mean, this is pretty big for us. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty pumped by this. And it's not, I mean, technically it's not a review, but it's a commendation. So I want to read it for you guys. And for those listening, thank you so much. We we were pretty much stolly in seventh position on the podcast rankings on Apple Podcasts all week. And you know who's in front of us, Anne? Who? McKinsey. McKinsey's podcast is in front of them, front of us. I am dead target centering that as my goal now is I to think, get in front of McKinsey. I think with our guests today on AM, with AM being joined, like this is some sharks versus jets territory right now. I, I think so too, but I think so too. But anyway, so normally this is where we do our reviews, but instead, I want to re read an email we received this past week from Dilip Kumar at Amazon. And for those of you who might not be familiar with Dilip's work, he is the vice president of physical retail for Amazon. So kind of a big deal. And he was one of our recent OmniStars recipients, the reward we created to recognize the top Omnichannel operators for 2022. Now, Anne, here is what Let's Dilip go. wrote to us. Let's he said, hear. Chris and Anne, thanks for the nomination. It's both rewarding and humbling to be recognized. You and Anne, this is my favorite part, you and Anne, on my must listen list as you both do an excellent job with your podcast best dilip i love the end to best dilip how does that make you feel i mean this is your first Boom. like piece of fan mail chris I, I feel like this is a big deal it is it's a huge deal i mean who i mean who is impacting the world of physical retailing more than dilip kumar at amazon yes. head of physical retail for amazon so thank you dilip we really appreciate that commendation um, it means a lot to us. If, if you want to join Dilip and you're listening on Apple podcasts, please leave us a review or heart the podcast. If you're on Spotify, Google, Amazon music, um, please remember to follow us and subscribe so that we can keep making all this content possible for you and for Dilip, um, and all of your teams out there. We may just read it aloud. We may. David and Mike. We have David Ritter and Mike Simonchik from the AM Consumer and Retail Group. Um, for those who are tuning into the show for the first time, let's uh, have you tell the audience a little bit about yourselves and your roles at AM. Uh, Mike, why don't you go first? Great. Hi, Mike Simonchik with AM Consumer and Retail Group. Um, I've been a longer term partner here at AM. I've been with the firm for almost 15 years. My career is 30 years plus, uh, a lot of that in, in industry. And in, in short, what I do is want to help companies on the front end strategy, but more importantly, all around operations and execution. I, I work uh, in helping bring marketing, merchandising, operations all together to deliver value. So we, we are just kind of knee deep in the execution of strategies and driving value and working across each function to deliver those results. 
Nice. The perfect guest for today. Kind yes. of a roll up your sleeves kind of guy. I take it. I like that, Mike. I like that. And we have uh, also our resident um, A&M expert, Dave Ritter, back on the podcast. Yeah, I think he's been on the show more than any guest we've ever had. Is that right, David? I think it is probably well, at this point. Sure, but, I've uh, lost I've, count. I've definitely been on a few times. Thanks for having me again. Uh, I'm Dave Ritter. Uh, I'm a long term, uh, long time consultant in the retail space. I was actually a partner at McKinsey for about 15 years. Uh, before I came over to uh, Alvarez and Marsal's Consumer Retail Group uh, to do things slightly different with a bit more of an execution impact orientation. So thanks. Those are fighting uh, words, Dave. Nice. Those it. are fighting words. I like it. Dave's getting the team riled up. We're nice. going to go for it. Kind of our mantra, too. <laughs> All right. Our, well, Chris. Yes, Ann. Let's get to the story. Let's get to the headlines. Today, we've got news on Instacart, Instacart quietly filing for an IPO, emphasis on quietly zara charging for returns in the uk peloton plan to sell its product through third-party retailers for the very first time and walmart trying to recruit college grads with promises of two hundred thousand dollar plus store manager salaries but first dan we take off with earnings galore this week oh man it was everybody's time this is another i think this is important because this is another example of just how pervasive the retail industry is and the impact it has on our, our global economy because everyone was talking about the target earnings today everyone's earnings target walmart, walmart home depot, Kohl's home depot today Kohl's, like right. crazy ross tjx you name it now nobody's um, talking about ross but yeah okay <laughs> well they're coming out people might care about those but you know anyway all right so target reported a stunning 52% drop in profit for the first quarter, sending the stock tumbling yesterday as much as 27%. Uh, Walmart also missed their earnings expectations and they got, man, they really got a beating on the in the news. Um, for the first fiscal quarter, as according to CNBC, the retailer felt cost pressure from fuel prices, higher inventory levels, and overstaffing. Um, on the other side of things, yeah. Home Depot raised its full year outlook, reported strong quarterly earnings, and posted its strongest first quarter sales ever, um, ever, ever. Yes. <laughs> uh, Mike, uh, let's go to you first. How, how should we read into these results? What are you thinking about this? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that, listen, I actually think, look, target, I think is a strong long-term play. I, I think they got I, surprised, I, you know, quite frankly, surprised the market surprised a lot of people with the short-term results. What I like about Target longer term, and I'll, I'll differentiate from Walmart here and Amazon in a moment. At the end of the day, I think Target has been finding the right balance of store and omni and e-commerce. They haven't overbuilt their network. They're finding a sweet spot. I think their pain is more short-term. They got, uh, you know, and surprising to me in the sense that I think they've been a very disciplined operator. But the short-term pain of, of the payroll and labor hours in the store, the short, and I, I refer to these as short-term because I believe they will correct their models. You know, they can't correct inflation to, and wages, but they definitely can correct how they staff stores, how they fill stores. I also think they can, they will make adjustments relative to pricing, merchandise mix, et cetera. Mm -hmm. you know, like the storm that's hit us is the consumer during the pandemic had money coming in, whether it was, you know, you know, government supported money or just not spending the same discretionary. They went out and bought big tickets and they went out and, and spent a lot of money and, and Target was a beneficiary. The Bed Baths were a beneficiary. The consumer now is, is, is scaling back, mm -hmm. focusing on smaller purchases, but they're still spending. And that's the story of Home Depot. I mean, that the consumer is still holding up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the interesting I, part of this. You know, the consumer, I think, is holding up, but there is a shift from bigger ticket to you know still what you know necessity or every day you know and i think that's what home depot is still playing in and we work with other retailers that i think are in smaller tickets they're holding up there's softness here let's not mm -hmm. get ourselves but are holding up in relative terms i think target pivots fine i think walmart and amazon are a little bit different because they they built a lot of infrastructure bet big on everything's delivered in 15 minutes and they've got some more structural overhead costs that they'll have to tackle Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I might disagree with that somewhat, Mike. This is good to have you on the show. Yeah. So let's, let's see what Dave's got to say first, though. Yeah, I, I also kind of disagree, Chris. I Well, I don't think this is a short-term blip uh, for Target or Walmart. Uh, frankly, I think if we look at the P&L of a retailer, 
inflation is hitting every single part of that. And there's no end in sight, right? Like cost of goods, mm -hmm. uh, their CPG partners are passing along uh, cost inflation to them. I think if we look at indirect costs, they're exploding and labor is both difficult to find and wage rates are going up. So I, uh, I think we might be in a new normal for call it 18 months uh, where they're just a less profitable model based on the kind of not anything they specifically did, but just market conditions more broadly. Yeah, I think so too. And I, I spent I spent all morning reading these earnings reports. And so before I go, what what are your take? What's your take here? I mean, I think more than anything, I'm I'm listening to what Mike's saying about what this means for the reactions from these retailers. Like, what are we going to start to see Walmart and Target do as a result of? and what Dave's saying, what might be planning for the next 18 months yep. of this. And so my hope is that we have retailers like Target, like Walmart, who've been a little slow to the game on moving things like, um, you know, figuring out faster ways of, of automation in house, mm -hmm. how to, how to work through some of these scenarios that they're still doing manually in store. And that my hope is that we start to see some investment in technology. That's going to help try to offset some of these things like labor, mm -hmm. like inflation that, that the team is talking about. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting points. So here's my, here's my take. And then we'll go back to, to Dave and Mike for kind of the, the final word here, but my big takeaway from these stories after reading the, the reading the earnings report say is it's all about inventory. It's actually all about the supply chain snapback that these companies are dealing with. And the reason I say that is you look at the numbers and Target's, I think, the best example of this. Target said traffic was up 4%. They did a 3% comp, which means their average transaction was down. And so you have to ask yourself, how in a period of inflation is your transaction, is your transaction size down? It makes no sense. And so really what you get back to is they were working through a hell of a lot of markdowns. And I queried some of my friends in the stores at Target and they said, yeah, we're still clearing through heck loads of inventory. We're still clearing through things from Christmas. Hmm. And so that puts it in a different perspective here. And Walmart said the same thing. That was the first thing they, they, they counted on. Yes, inflation's a factor, but how much of those costs are being passed on the consumers? It sounds like they're still you know, somewhat buying this growth to hmm. some degree. And then most of the issues is in the markdown on the inventory side. The other point I would make, and this is where I, agree, I disagree with Mike, particularly on Target's outlook, I was looking back at some numbers. I think these are interesting. So Target's market cap in 2017, when we left, it was about $32 billion. Mm -hmm. At the height of the pandemic, which as we've said with talking about Instacart too, that's as good as it's going to get, right? <laughs> it's as good as it's going to get for, e uh, for Instacart's business. It's probably as good as it's going to get for Target and Walmart's business because you had so much money going towards products and right. versus services. And now that's part of this equation too, is people are snapping back and purchasing more services. Their market cap got up to $130 billion, mm -hmm. roughly, give or take, you know, during this period of time. Now it's at 75 billion. So, you know, I sit back and I say to myself, okay, you know, where does this thing settle out? And then I put them in comparison with Walmart, where Walmart's got things like Flipkart, Go Local, Walmart Plus, Rivet Capital, Walmart Health. They've got some, some, some dry powder in the growth keg. Mm -hmm. Whereas you look at Walmart, where's that growth or improvement in market cap come at from? Target, at, um, yeah, Target. Target. Thank yeah. you. It's really, they haven't really added many stores. Mm -hmm. It's all come from pandemic fueled growth or market share grabs as other retailers have gone away because of e-commerce. So it leaves me wondering here, where is the growth story to come for Target here in the right. future? And that's a big open question for me, quite honestly. And the other point I would make to that is I think people are getting the punchline of the joke because Target has seen a mass of exodus, a mass exodus of good retail talent leave the company recently, mm -hmm. as we know from following our friends on LinkedIn, which other people might not see, but anyway, they just got their dividends that were more in the first quarter than they were the whole last year. Exactly. Like it's like big things like that. Like mm -hmm. it goes to my point of like, right. it's as good as it's going to get. Right. And so, so yeah. So anyway, that's long story, but I felt like it was important to cover, but Mike, I'll go back to you. Cause I, you know, I kind of disagree with you, but curious what you think on that take. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, listen to things, I, not to misrepresent it. I, I don't think this is a blip. I think this is a more in towards Dave said an 18 month cycle. Okay. But what I would I would emphasize here, and I, I build on what Ann shared, I believe these companies and where I think they have profit optimization and improvement is getting back to those basics that she shared, it, it, innovating more in the store, innovating more with categories. You know, I think the, the one thing I would I would remind us, you know, I, I've lived the story of Target being in trouble 20 years ago. Yeah, right. Prior, prior to Brian Cornell, everybody's right. like, well, they built too many stores. They're not going to be around anymore. Right. Or they're going to get wiped out. 
I wouldn't, um, you know, Target has, for, for my vantage point, it's an enduring brand. Yep. It's still delivering phenomenal value proposition. And I think it has the wherewithal. I agree with Dave. We got 12 to 18 months of headwind. That's not going to be easy to solve. But I actually think this is a management team that can solve it. And I think that that will unlock new growth. And I think that they're also, I think they're still very focused on their core, which I think will be a positive to work as, as, a, as a source as they work through the next 12 to 18 months of headwinds. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I think that makes sense too. And net net, you know, what you're saying there is you'd rather be a Walmart or a target and trying to deal with this than say another retailer that's not on as sturdy of ground, right? That's the key takeaway. Yeah. All right. Well, let's keep rolling now. So I mentioned this company already, but Instacart Ann has quietly filed for an IPO. Again, according to CNBC, Instacart said late Wednesday, last Wednesday, actually, that it has filed a draft registration statement with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, paving the way for the firm to list its shares. Now, you'll remember that in March of 2021, Instacart was valued at $39 billion when it last raised $265 million. However, as we covered on this show extensively, that valuation dropped this past March 2022, roughly one year later when Instacart, on its own volition, took its valuation down to $24 billion. So, David, my question for you, and this is a fun one, how does Instacart's plan to go public make you feel? Does the move make you more optimistic about Instacart's future? Or do you look at this move as more of a now or never kind of move? I love that this move? is a feeling question. I know. Like, Dave, how do you feel? Did you get warm fuzzies with this? <laughs> I'm like the last person in the world. Yeah, though, right? Like, that's how the people question. react. Um, no, it, it makes me feel sad. Um, Does it? Unfortunately, it makes you feel sad. Wow. Yeah, depressed. Okay. I think Instacart just timed this IPO pretty poorly and is going to end up leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, I really believe this, unfortunately, is an now or never move. Um, while I'm bullish on the grocery kind of delivery ecosystem from a customer perspective, you know, Instacart struggle with profitability. And in a market where uh, fuel costs are going up, driver costs are going up, I just think they could be in for a few tough years. And this is one of those moves where it's, you know, in an IPO market that is starting to look more and more at profitability as opposed to growth, um, that this is an now or never move. So you're not at all optimistic about this like technology platform play that they've switched to, you know, as a backdrop in terms of you know, how they're going to fuel this growth as well. I mean, listen, I think some of the software as a service stuff that they've got, you know, whether it's the, the helping with the pick path in the stores, uh, et cetera, I, I think it's fine. I don't think it's going to justify the kind of valuation that they used to have before. Um, it's just you'd have to imagine uh, a lot of adoption to get to the point uh, where those revenues offset. Uh, offset just the the kind of the, the the negative sink that you get from the from the core business. Yeah. Now, no, this is interesting. I see. We'll see. We'll see if we're all aligned. I'm pretty much where you are on this one, Mike. What's your thoughts? I don't know where Ann is on this, but Mike, what's your thoughts? I, I'm with Dave. Really I think it's a, a now or never. I, I I'm less bullish on the company overall. I feel it's an interim business model to a different. You know, the the right solution and, and you know getting grocery to home will not be an Instacart model. I think it will be a more more clear direct model leveraging technology leveraging scale i think it, instacart plays a, it kind of a, a interim role in, in our models and i i so i think it's uh, now or never and try to grab what they can but i i think they have a tough road ahead wow okay it's it's almost resolute here resolutely uh uh, uh in agreement here and what do you think well, I, I agree. I think it's interesting what it, it follows along with what we said about Target and Walmart in the last story. I mean, they saw Instacart just saw the best right. situation they're ever going to get. They're still seeing that. I think their Instacart is a Band-Aid solution. We talked about Publix a couple of weeks ago. They're helping Publix do 15 minute or less delivery. Like there is still a purpose for Instacart right now. So I think it's actually the best time that they could have done this IPO yeah. because they have they still have value that they're showing the market mm -hmm. like we can come in and in you know a few days we can turn on micro fulfillment we can turn on 15 minute delivery we can give you delivery we can do picking and packing in the stores but i think it reminds me of an interview we did this week with rafe um systems talking and the founder of rafe the ceo Hasib badani said you need to have this conversation in your organization about build versus buy and what, when it makes sense to build something internally versus outsource it to somebody like Instacart. And I think this is an example, like Mike, like Dave was saying, of a scenario where in the long term, yeah, right. grocers, especially mass merchants, the, the giant retailers that 
Instacart needs to ha- maintain viability, those retailers are going to bring this in house, and then Instacart is nothing. Yeah, they were they were renting it, so right, to speak. Exactly. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything you guys have said. I mean, I think it's a it's a move of total desperation at this point. The prospects are growing worse by the minute, and I also wonder. And I, I don't remember where I read this, but I thought it was an interesting take. Was you know, I also wonder if it's a way to get potential inqu- uh, acquirers interested I in it so before too, it goes yeah. public too. And you know, Walmart's been thrown around. I've thrown that around. I got to tell you, I'm lo- I'm feeling good about my prediction where I said, you know, we're gonna look back in a few years. I said this in Forbes, uh, I think last year, or the year before, even um, we're gonna lo- be looking at this as the company formerly known as Instacart at some point. You know, the prince it, of retail. It, it really, yeah, it's really going to be oh. that. And this is just another indication to me on that. They they have no choice but to try to do this yeah. in a lot of ways. So it's it's probably the smartest move their leadership's made in the last year, year and a half, in my opinion. But all right, Anne, let's keep rolling. All right. Headline number three, Peloton also had a very disappointing earnings <laughs> yeah, week. Right? Bump, bump, bump. Um, keeps, hits keep on. I Come know. On. Uh, so Peloton's losses year over year in the fiscal third quarter grew $757 million or $2.27 per share versus $8.6 million or $0.03 cents a share uh, just a year earlier. Its revenue dropped to $964.3 million from $1.26 billion. And the new CEO, Barry McCarthy, according to CNBC, said that in addition to expanding subscription revenue, the company now plans to sell its products through third-party retailers, a step that the company has not yet taken before. Um, Mike, let's go to you first. I got to hear, what what do you think about this move to sell through third parties? Can Peloton maintain the brand cachet if you can now get them inside a Target, for example? I, I think they have to. I, 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 I feel like, to. yeah, really? I, I feel okay. like, look, Back to kind of a theme here. This is a company that you know is a great output of the, the pandemic, people at home. I think when you look at it, I think it is actually more of a service company than a hardware company. Obviously the money's coming through the bikes, but really it's the service in the community that makes it, it that is differentiating for the business. I actually don't think the bike itself is all that differentiating or some of the other hard, if you will, the physical infrastructure. Mm-hmm. I think this is a really hard pivot for them. I think they have, they face a really hard pivot because I think moving to, you know, Hey, we're going to be a subscription based model. We're going to go through third party retail. Um, you know, you, you talked about, you know, you shared the losses. I, I believe the more interesting play here is, is consolidation in the space. Um, and I think Peloton has probably done a sufficient to effective job of branding it's, it's the leading potential brand in that space. Mm-hmm. I don't, I, I think it needs a, a, a structural solution um, versus on, you know, operation, you know, what I'll describe as continuous improvement. So your take is that, so your take, if I summarize that is that they kind of have to do this or possibly look at an acquisition here at some point down the road as well. Okay. Yeah. Merger, you know, merger, merger, acquisition, merger. consolidation yeah. of, of other players. I, I just, you know, I don't see the space back to you. I don't see the space continuing to grow massively. Mm-hmm. I think we're going to have a right. slow it's growth. As big as it's been, yeah. It's as big as it's been. Same point. I think the subscription model is the recurring revenue that you would want. Mm-hmm. Yep. How do you lower your your overhead and your infrastructure costs to to have a very profitable subscription business? And I think that ultimately then gets into the question of I think other providers of the similar competitors haven't had the brand effectiveness the consumer awareness that Peloton has. So that's where I think there could be some synergies in place. Right. Absolutely. Okay. I'm, I'm dying to get what Ansic is on this, but Dave, what do you think? Do you agree or disagree with your colleague, Mike? No, uh, so I slightly disagree. I, listen, I think the wholesale channel might be a desperation move, but controlling your brand in the wholesale channel is tough. I was yeah. actually in Nordstrom's this weekend and they had a tonal set up and like, yeah. it wasn't great. Right. It didn't scream. Uh, the Peloton experience, right? Like, no. So I just think that's a tough from a brand proposition. I agree with Mike, however, though, that it might be necessary uh, just to try to get as many points of distribution as possible, um, given the, the kind of economic hardships that they're facing. The other thing I thought was interesting was on subscription revenue increases, what he really is saying is price increases, right? Yeah, right, 100%. So, there's almost no world where they're going to grow off the pandemic uh, kind of peak. So price increases in the kind of economic environment that we've talked about on this podcast the whole time just feels like, I mean, that just doesn't feel like a particularly effective strategy. 
Um, and maybe Peloton's customer base is more affluent and can, and can handle it. But I, I don't know, price increases in a looming recessionary environment feels uh, kind of out of touch. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. I tend to lean more with what you're saying. I mean, I think I, I'll be, I'll be pretty candid on this one. I, I, I kind of hate this move. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really do. I feel like it's, I feel like it's Peloton getting hung up on its own bad press of late. Hmm. Cause I think there's some, there's some key statistics that you can pull out from these articles. Like they still gained 195,000 subscribers last quarter and their attrition rate actually went down. It went down from almost, you know, 0.8% to 0.75%. That still shows me that it's a healthy brand because, again, it was at its peak and it's still growing. Mm -hmm. So why would I want to then, you know, go into a third party for my distribution? Because then you're just like Nordic track. You know, you're the same. You're, you're basically devaluing your brand, in my opinion. Hmm. And or you're like, like, Dave, I think the tonal example is really great. Or the mirror example. I was in Lululemon this weekend. There's no one looking at the mirror. The place is packed. No one's looking at it. No one's engaging with it. And then the other thing that comes with that, too, that I think is really important. You get lumpy inventory. And as we said at the outset in the first headline, then you get markdowns. And then there goes your cachet, right? Because you have to start discounting this to clear through the inventory. And so I just think with those type of subscriber statistics, and you can, yes, you can find the balance on the subscription revenue that Dave's talking about. There's no reason to not go direct in this example. Like mm -hmm. build out your own stores, keep the network going through your own channels. I think Mike's point about maybe if you're really suffering or needing to find an outlet, Look at a merger, look at, you know, potential acquire or something like that. I, I don't like the move of third party at all. I completely disagree. Wow, really? Yeah, I do. Why? Because I think that Peloton has been going after a very specific market. They've been going after a high earning individual. They have not been going over, out for mass. And like, so you think they should go mass? I, I'm not saying they should just go mass. But I think that they should take the approach that we've seen Lululemon, that we've seen Apple do, where you have certain retailers who you think can maintain a certain level for your brand, but also allow you, like I'm thinking of like Target, okay? So Target selling, they have Apple products in their stores. It's giving people exposure to the brand. And especially when you're talking about what Mike's talking about, about the subscription revenue. And you said too, like that's the subscription is where they're making their money. It doesn't have to be about the hardware itself. And I think that the more people that you get exposed to the brand, being able yeah. to have a taste of Peloton at $39.99 a month yeah. is attainable for people. Yeah. They still get to have the power of the brand, which is in the people that are running the programming and the programming itself. Like this is a future for a lot of people of having a hybrid workout experience. And the more access that you have to seeing the bike in your target store or in a, you know, very selected, maybe a Dick sporting goods or something, I think makes more sense than just completely keeping it in the a malls and only allowing a certain subset of the country uh, to be able to experience that brand. All right. Well, I want to, I want to press you on this. Yeah. This is why I love this show. And this is why I love having top-notch retail consultants yes. on actually debating the issues, like is, which is incredibly hard to find. And last week we, we argued and I came to your side. So I'm going to press you a little bit okay. on this. I would argue that it's still accessible now, like based on its internet presence, if you want a Peloton, it's pretty easy to find one. It's not like it's, it's like being sh kept from certain people. So like, you know, to, to some I degree, think because we are in the target market for the Peloton. Well, I agree. That's who they're marketing to. But if, if you get wind of it, you can easily get one. It, it provided the inventory is there, which granted is a problem, but that's a separate point. My point to you, my question to you though, is who are those retailers? Who are those retailers where that's you're going to place this? Like, Target, you're going to have the, the, the kid that's 18 year old in khaki selling this for you. No way. Not to say it's going to become like Nordic track Best Buy. Same issue. Like it's just going to become something in the sea of all Target doesn't even carry uh, extra equipment, but Dix is maybe one, you know, Best Buy is another one maybe, but then it just becomes another bike or treadmill in the lineup of bikes and treadmills. And it's going to be hard to differentiate. So I don't know. I, I but I guess who what, are those people? Is I, my question. I guess you're not. I think I, I think I need to make a point of differentiation about what the the store experience is. And I don't know that it's going to be hardware every single time. I still think that there's a, a potential to create an activation with a brand partnership, for example, with a Target, where you have Target and Peloton teaming up, and there's a Peloton like space in the target or you know you could have a bike there but it doesn't necessarily mean it's about the bike i think it's, it's like about about the subscription and getting more people exposed to like here's a peloton class we're gonna play it like 
people would sit and watch the Peloton class depending on who the instructor is. That's an interesting idea. We've talked about that before. Like, could you have like actually Peloton classes where the bikes are set up for you? But Dave, Mike, any last thoughts on this one? Yeah, I've got, I've got one last thought is I think the CEO of Peloton should start spending a lot of time in Oregon because Nike is the, I think a Nike acquisition is the smartest move here uh, that actually makes sense from a market perspective. Yeah, Nike or Apple. That's the other thing that I was thinking of as Ann was talking to. Mike, any thoughts? Just uh, this business is bleeding cash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of the stay the course, keep appealing to the same people. Just might not work, right? It's Well, let's not say might not. Mm-hmm. it's not it's not so, right so so you you gotta ask yourself like how much more are we gonna keep bleeding here yeah and i think that um i think they can if i'm i'm with Anne. i think they have to expose uh, the bottom line is they have to figure out a way to get greater scale mm-hmm. and i think one means is further exposure i think dave's on it with i, I come back to i think an acquisition is or, or some partnership is is a path forward yeah, that's an interesting point too. Like that actually makes me think like I, you know, I would take my rabid fan base and ask them to help us through that issue then, you know, through the subscription increases too, as another point. All right, well, let's keep rolling. God, this is a great podcast. I love this. All right, headline number four, Zara is now charging customers in the UK for online returns. According to industry.fashion, starting this month, UK customers who have purchased an item online will now have to pay $1.95, uh, $1.95 sterling that will be deducted from their full product refund. Customers will also have 30 days to return any items and they can no longer return separate orders in the same box. Purchases made in store can still be returned free of charge if they are returned to a store in the same region. So net net, this means if you live in the UK and you want to return a Zara item you purchase online, it sounds like you're going to have to pay roughly two quid to do so. So Mike, I'm curious, do you see this as a one-off implementation or do you see this as a sign of something more to come more broadly across retail? What's your take here? You know, um, it's a broad retail challenge. So we did a lot of research on this. I mean, the cost of returns, the amount of returns, it is very expensive. It's very difficult. The flip side is the consumer wants the easiest, simplest, hassle-free experience. And actually, we did a fair amount of research that said a consumer makes a purchasing decision based on their perception of how easy it is to return. Right. So this flies against all of that, obviously. The only, I I would say, caveat in Zara's case is, and this is where I see a a little bit of a hybrid one-off, the model of a Zara Zara consumer is going to be to buy 10 things, try them all on and see what you like and don't you like. So I I can think they have a bit of a more unique tech tied to their customer model. I don't see this as a go forward industry. I I think this would be a very difficult industry trend. Mm -hmm. And I'll be curious. I don't think it will go well with Zara customers as well. And do you think the same thing? Uh, I think I agree doing this like cold Turkey and just do, especially as a, as an avid Zara shopper, like this is going to be a nightmare. Um, if you're going to not only make me wait in line and you're going to charge me for the returns, like it's a terrible experience to do in store. Yeah. For an online item. Yeah. Yes. I think you're going to start to see abandonment of baskets of of people waiting in the same line to purchase Zara thing. I mean, again, I've said this ad nauseum on this podcast, but like waiting in line at Zara on this, on a Saturday is like an hour long thing. This is not, it's a terrible experience. And now you're going to have people who I think if, you know, if you have people coming in returns and doing that, it's going to be a disaster. But my hope is that we start to see Zara expand the pilot that they're doing in Madrid right now with like the clever on pickup and return lockers, Mm -hmm. where if you are going to do this, tell me like Mike's saying, what are my options? Tell me in advance. The price? I can go in and if I submit this return via the return locker, then I don't get charged for that. And I do think that because of the impact of returns for other fast fashion online retailers like Zara, we are going to start to see this happen where they're going to get charged or you have to take an option that's going to reduce friction both from the store associates and from the consumer. That's a really interesting point. So you're saying like, do we set the price high at yes. the funnel so you know buyer beware exactly. what you're going to get? And then do we over time start to come up with new ways to 
to, to take that cost out of the equation for yes. consumers. It's very easy for them to understand. That's an interesting and point. I just spoke with this morning. I'm going to be interviewing um, a founder of, an, of a company who used to be in charge of innovation for Inditex. Um, oh, he used yeah. to be the global head of innovation. And I asked him at about- Shop Talk? Uh, yeah, Shop Talk nice. in Europe. And I asked him about this and he said, he's like, I think we will start to see so many more retailers start to roll this out. Like huh. his perspective was, this is something that the industry cannot avoid there. It's the cost of returns is so significant, especially in these types of categories that they have to do something to kind of make up for that. That's a really interesting position. I hadn't thought about it from that angle of like, mm -hmm. do we reset the level and then give people options coming down that line? I, I never thought about that because I was kind of where Mike was initially and even where you were too, where this seems like a hard thing for consumers to swallow, but maybe not over the long haul if you think about it that way. Dave, what do you think? I mean, we've just spent decades training a consumer to buy a whole bunch of products, try on different sizes and send them back. Um, I'm always a little wary when you, when you talk about tearing a Band-Aid off uh, after 20 years of taught behavior, right? I, I'm kind of with Mike. I, I think it's risky. That said, I think it's something to keep an eye on because, I yeah. mean, returns is clearly a huge problem. And, uh, and an expensive problem that, uh, that I think retailers do need to figure out and whether that's a tiered system like you guys were talking about or, or this you know pay to return. It, it also feels like a lot for the order size at Zara. Um, yeah. So you know it's just I think it's, uh, I, I think it'll be tough to, to drive adoption. I think it'll actually probably hurt their e-commerce sales in the UK. Uh, but it's, it's certainly something to keep an eye on because it's a problem that needs to be get solved. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. So you think one last question. So you think two two pounds is a lot, roughly? You think that you know for them that's a lot? Or because my initial inclination was like, yeah, okay, maybe that's not that much too. Like it doesn't actually dissuade me from still doing it or still trying it to some degree. But what's I just feel like Zara is such a value brand mm -hmm. that uh, I worry that anything over you know like one is right. uh, mm -hmm. is too much, right? Like I, so I anything think it's, is uh, any 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 dollar number for for the, the Zara customer. I mean, the, the whole point of fast fashion is to is, is for people that can afford it. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right, makes sense. Yeah. I actually think Ian, though, is on to where I think this could evolve. Where it yeah, it's really interesting. What I am seeing is, is retailers today trying to incent the customer to go to the most efficient mm -hmm. model. You know, Amazon set up a deal with Kohl's to try to run things through Kohl's and, yep. and they actually incent you. You get a, a discount if you go back there. So I think the retailers are at the stage of carrots, so to speak, trying to get you to, to find the most efficient path back, it would not surprise me to see them add some sticks. Like if you choose to go the other path, we're gonna charge it. Exactly. To, the problem has to get solved. They need to get the product going in a more efficient uh, return process. Absolutely. Um, all right, Mike and Dave and Chris, we are gonna move on to headline number five. Walmart went out of its way this week to attract college graduates to work in its stores. According to Bloomberg, Walmart has recently unveiled a new college two, the number two <laughs> career program that will provide classroom training, hands-on experience and mentoring for recent and soon to be graduates. According to a Walmart statement, top performers will be offered a newly created management role as an emerging coach, which provides the starting pay of, a, real. of at least $65,000 a year and a speedy path to becoming a store manager. Uh, they said, quote, we see the emerging coach role as an additional pipeline to develop high potential talent into future store managers, the latter role with an average wage of approximately $210,000 in 2021, end quote. David, we're going to you first. Do you think this will give college grads an enticing reason to look at Walmart as a career opportunity, or is it just PR window dressing, as David Brown said famously? Yeah, that's a, right. A, a podcast not too long ago. <laughs> Well, so the first thing I'd say is kudos to Walmart. I think we all know that the store manager is the most important role in retail uh, and is capable of really driving results in an individual box. So at least kudos to them for trying to up their ta talent levels, whether it's PR or real. Right. Um, it feels like this is going to be a good test to see if, if they can move the needle. But it, to me, it feels much more just like a test. Um, so in that sense, maybe a bit more PR. Um, one thing that I do think is interesting about this and, and uh, my worry about their approach in this is that many new college graduates are Gen Z and Walmart yeah. is going back to the level uh, or the lever of compensation. You know, and and it, I think if you if you interview these people, or you look at any behavioral, like they're much more into purpose-driven organizations, yeah. mm -hmm. flexibility and scheduling. 
So, you know, I, we continue to see retailers go back to the well from 10 years ago where wage rate is the thing that matters most. And that's not what attracts this, this uh, demographic of talent. Right. So I, like, I, I wish that, they, that there were other parts of the program that were more oriented against the, t- the college grad that they're targeting. Yeah, I agree with you. And I'm curious, I, I'm curious, Mike, to get your take on this. I'm going to put a little spit on this one too. But, you know, I, I, I think it's, it is more PR window dressing. I think you just look at the numbers. Like, you know, your odds of making the NFL relative to being a store manager are not that different. And the NFL payouts a lot higher. When you think about it, there's only 4,600 Walmart stores. So if you, head in, if you head into the store, the chances of you seeing this payout are really slim. And I'm not trying to be a downer. I'm just trying to be a realist. You know, you're one of 4,600 opportunities. And many of those opportunities are already taken up by long tenured good store managers. So the chances of you getting there are low. You know, so I agree. It's like admirable at the end of the day. But but this is my question is like when you get down to it, there's probably more headquarters employees making more than two hundred thousand dollars or that salary they're quoting than there are store managers. So what it actually tells me is that our store employees are probably still underpaid when yeah. you put it in that perspective. So, Mike, what do you think? I see you shaking your head in the affirmative. Do you agree with that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I just have a different spin. I, I feel like Walmart should put its emphasis on the people that work for them today. Yeah, you know the idea that they got to go to college to get a future store manager Mm -hmm. when they have all these people in the stores. They should focus on the you know maybe it's an old principle, but there were folks who started out at Stock Boys who became executives. Hundred percent agree. And I think they really should be promoting a motion of come in work for us at any entry level, and we have programs in house to fast track you and to get to assistant store manager or to your point, because the store managers are pretty, you know, there's only going to be so many, but I think creating more growth opportunity for the frontline work employee and almost kind of saying some of this, it's like a kind of a class thing here. So we don't always need to just go find the college grad. Why don't we just work with the people we're employing and give them greater opportunities? I, and I, we'll go to you on the end and close this up here. But I totally agree with you, Mike. I mean, as a former district manager, store manager for Target, I used to argue with Target and say, why do we need to hire college grads? I've got t- tons of really great people working my floors that could easily be store managers right. one day. And many of them have become that. And right. they've become very good at the job. Right. Well, I think that's the most critical part that we need to address here is that you need time in the stores in order to become, I think, the best HQ uh, employee or store managers. And that's, I guess, where I'd be focusing if I, as if I was Walmart is how do you just create a blanket program where your goal, your goal setting, whether you're a store employee or going right into HQ, how do you create the best, well, most well-rounded employee and then goal them at these, these not $212,000 a year, but how do you really create that opportunity uh, regardless of where you're coming from, how do you get them to be starting in the store or starting at HQ or like, you know, I just feel like there's, there needs to be more well-rounded, um, approaches to hiring and how they're going to do that, including, you know, these people in the stores, I'd be furious. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> I'd be, I'd be really yeah. Upset. And I think they probably are quite honestly, yeah. if they read this story, which maybe they did, or maybe they didn't, but you're right. The latter has many rungs mm-hmm. and it can go in many directions. That's an important point too. All right. And let's close this up. All right. Let's get to the lightning round. Um, so first question is for David, Dave, Recurate is a peer to peer resale platform that allows brands to bring resale onto their own sites. And they just raised $14 million to continue to do so. Dave, what was the last thing that you sold online? Oh man, this is going to make me sound so old. I have personally never sold anything online. <laughs> Ever. That said, I haven't my, either. Uh, my wife did sell a table uh, when we moved uh, on uh, Facebook. Uh, a marketplace. Marketplace, yeah. Okay, well, I'll give you that kind of by association. Yeah, I guess right? I'd have to go back to Craigslist, like 2003 oh for me. God. But anyway, all right, Michael, Taco Bell's Mexican pizza is back. Yes. What was or still is your go-to Taco Bell delight? Yeah, I'll tell you, it's like so boring. Bean burrito with hot sauce. No, that's not oh, boring. That's totally what? acceptable. I totally agree with that. What's yours? Well, in high school, it was the Chorito, which I don't even think they have anymore. I think it was called the Chorito, but yes. anyway. Chalupa all the way. Ugh. Um. Okay, <laughs> Dave, second question for you. Uh, former Disney CEO Bob Iger has joined as an investor and advisor for GoPuff. Dave, what would you have instantly delivered to you if you knew you had a full day at Disney World ahead of you? 
Well, this is a no-brainer. Sunscreen. Oh, <laughs> sunscreen, sunscreen. Yes. I was gonna say, you know, they deliver booze, right? Like that's also <laughs> a possibility. I just don't know if you can take it in. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter if you put it in your coffee cup. No one's gonna know. Twelve six packs. Yeah, the fair skin David Ritter answering honestly <laughs> and truthfully. I love that. All right, Mike. Last question. Kraft Heinz is reportedly piloting a paper-based ketchup bottle. Channeling my inner Elaine Bennis, what is your go-to ketchup secret or technique for getting ketchup out of the bottle? God almighty. Uh, holy smokes. So it's <laughs> cap on, bang the bottom. Bang the bottom. Cap okay. Cap, cap on, on, bang, bang the, bottom. the bottom. Top off. <laughs> Use the knife. Or the French fry. If you're watching the video, this is even better. Yes, I love the the visualization. Go to roughly minute 45 and watch this. It was well <laughs> worth, well worth, it'll be well, well worth your effort. All right, that closes yeah. us up. Happy birthday today to, hope I'm saying this right, and please correct me if I'm not, because I have no idea, but Jojo Siwa, is yeah. that right? All right. The, the, I don't know what she does, but I hear about her all the time. <laughs> Kevin Garnett, and one of the most underrated James Bond actresses who ever starred on the screen and played Mayday in A View to a Kill, The Great. Grace Jones. And remember, if you can only read or listen to one retail blog in the business, make it Omni Talk. Our Fast Five podcast is the quickest, fastest rundown of all the week's top news. And our twice weekly newsletter tells you the top five things you need to know each day and also features special content exclusive to us and just for you. And it fits all within the preview pane of your inbox. You can sign up today at www.omnitalk.blog. Thanks as always for listening in. Please remember, as we said at the outset, to like and leave us a review wherever you happen to listen to your podcast or on YouTube. And Dave, if people want to get in touch with you guys, chat a little retail, pick your brains for advice as consultants, what's the best way for them to do that? We have several options. Uh, the first is our website, which is www.alvarezandmarsal-crg.com. Uh, we have a LinkedIn page, which is Alvarez and Marsal Consumer and Retail Group. Or finally, they can feel free to reach out to me or Mike directly via LinkedIn. Awesome, awesome. And finally, apologies to Steve Dennis. We had hoped to have on this pre-recorded podcast, but we ran out of time. And of course, as always, be careful out there. The Yummy Talk Fast Five is a Microsoft sponsored podcast. Microsoft Cloud for Retail connects your customers, your people, and your data across the shopper journey, delivering personalized experiences and operational excellence. And is also brought to you in association with the AM Consumer and Retail Group. The AM Consumer and Retail Group is a management consulting firm that tackles the most complex challenges and advances its clients, people, and communities toward their maximum potential. CRG brings the experience, tools, and operator-like pragmatism to help retailers and consumer products companies be on the right side of disruption. And Takeoff. Takeoff is transforming grocery by powering grocers to thrive online. The key is micro-fulfillment, small robotic fulfillment centers that can be leveraged at a hyper-local scale. Takeoff also offers a robust software suite so grocers can seamlessly integrate the robotic solution into their existing businesses. To learn more, visit takeoff.com. And finally, Sezzle. Sezzle is an innovative buy now, pay later solution that allows shoppers to split purchases into four interest-free payments over six weeks. To learn more, visit sezzle.com.